they, they always put me like right after lunch on the last day. I think I always have this spot. Um, so just because I like having fun and I've got to be up here standing up and everyone just had some lunch and you're probably getting a little tired, right? I want everyone to stand up, please. Everyone stand up. Oh Including Sally Young. <laughs> All right. Okay, everyone stand up, put your hands in the air. Wiggle those fingers or something, do something silly. All right, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> now I know that at least everyone was awake at some point <laughs> while I was up here. I think I'm okay to start. There's no one in the back like waving at me or anything. Are you waving at me? Oh, great, cool. Thumbs up. So, thanks for coming to this session. It's about Houdini, and it's about the future of CSS at DrupalCon Vienna 2017. Um, this, is the, this is part of the Horizons track, and I thought I would give a little bit of a reason why it's in Horizons. Um, first of all, this is a presentation about front-end technology. It has absolutely nothing to do with Drupal, um, but as with all things front-end, eventually it uh, makes something easier to do no matter what your CMS is, so eventually Drupal users will find benefits to this. Uh, so, you know, advances in CSS made responsive web design possible, that made lots of other things possible in Drupal and so forth. Uh, same with this. Um, additionally, this is brand new and in flux and not released yet, so it's kind of like on the horizon um, in time as well. So just sit back, relax. There's nothing to try, practically nothing that can be done. Um, this is just a process that's uh, starting and going to be finalized probably you know, after some time. Um, but it will dramatically change the process of uh, CSS development when it does land. Um, but like I said, there's really nothing you can go try today except for a few little uh, doodads and widgets and um, just take it all in and keep it in mind for the future. Um, so good news, we'll start with the good news because this always ends up being a question that ask, gets asked at the end. Um, this is a cross-browser initiative that has the buy-in of the big five. So um, all of the browser vendors have identified this problem. It's uh, solving a problem that's inherent to the de facto rendering process in the browser itself. Um, so it's universal and all of them are interested in solving it. Uh, there is a website up with a lot of these up and coming specs. Someone makes a little landing page and says, is X ready yet? And so you can go to, is Houdini ready yet? Um, and check it out. So the red boxes there say no signal. This is a little tiny on this uh, projector but the red boxes don't mean they're not doing it or don't support it, it just means they haven't, the, de the DevRel team hasn't uh, made a signal as to whether or not where they are in the process of shipping this feature. Um, as you might be able to see, the Chrome team is the most active and even they have no signals on uh, uh, some of these components. But um, like I said, all five of them are interested and actively involved in talks. I can't even think of another web technology where the, the, the five of them sat down in a room and talked together about something, like even Apple is doing this. Um, so you can always check back, is Houdini ready yet? Of course, as it starts shipping, it'll show up on can I use per usual. So the title of the talk was called The Future of CSS, but it's really more like the future of CSS specs, um, or tools, or libraries, this kind of thing. Because the good news is that CSS will remain the same as it's always been uh, from an author's perspective. There's a really simple declarative syntax that you can use to provide powerful features to your front end. Um, so much like with 3D transforms, you don't have to know how to render anything in 3D. Most of the hard work is done for you. You just say, rotate my DOM element a few degrees. 
And so that's the real power of CSS, whether it's CSS grid or the box model positioning, anything like that. Um, so what we're going to look at here are tools that will basically provide CSS authors with familiar looking syntaxes that do crazy powerful things. Uh, another benefit is that CSS will be able to evolve more quickly with Houdini. We're going to look at some diagrams that will clarify this uh, more in a minute, but a common comparison and we're all familiar with is that CSS features have historically taken years to ship and we hear about something and then three or four years later it's finally safe to use. Uh, meanwhile in JavaScript with transpilers and other tools like Babel, uh, someone can think of an idea and a week later be using it in production because they can transpile it to a different JavaScript syntax that is available in the browser today. And Houdini will kind of have that effect as well in that in a Houdini compliant browser, one will be able to use future CSS that hasn't been invented yet or isn't quite normalized, the behavior isn't quite normalized. And so we do this in other uh, steps of our dev process right now, auto prefixer or um, you know, vendor prefixing was the predecessor to auto doing that. Um, CSS hacks were before that. And we were selecting various behaviors and manually correcting for browser differences. And uh, this is just another iteration of being able to normalize the behavior of browsers, um, which is very powerful. That is, in fact, the main power of JavaScript and why it took over the world and it's the most common runtime is because it's so flexible, it can fix itself and behave the same. Uh, if uh, uh, jQuery is the most popular example of this, it you know, may do not have to do a bunch of DOM manipulation, you just use jQuery. So the extensible web manifesto is a guiding principle for web vendors, so web uh, browser vendors. And the browser vendors, this is just a, an agreement. There's no, there's no binding aspect to this. But the extensible web manifesto says that in order to move the web forward, we should prefer flexible, low-level APIs instead of dra gravitating towards opinionated, high-level features. A relevant and current example of this is application cache, which was part of the HTML5 spec, which took years to be finalized, shipped, and used inside the browsers. And then it was really a train wreck um, when, it, when it started being used in the real world. There were big flaws in it, and people couldn't uh, use it for what it was intended for, um, but we didn't know that until it got shipped and we couldn't use it, and then now there's this broken feature that is practically unused across the greater web. The response to that bad feature was to develop the service worker spec, and service worker is a superset of application cache, and in fact, it's trivial using, you know, tools to basically generate app cache behavior inside your service worker, there's like a button you press on one of the, the tools and you just get app cache with service worker. Um, so instead of giving developers this, this thing and saying you have to do it this way, a lot of these powerful specs are being written to be very flexible. Yes, you could do more damage this way, but the trade-off is that then Build tools can be made and packages can be, you can customize this at, uh, and have very many um, products built on top of a web spec. And uh, like I said, Service Worker is a very relevant one today and Houdini is built in this spirit so that things can actually be shipped a little more quickly behind browser flags and they aren't exposed to the public until the spec is finalized, but in the meantime, uh, you can turn a flag on the experimental web platform flag in, in Blink, in Chrome. And uh, you can start using it and building things even if it's just a code pen. 
And then they can get developer feedback. People can even push it out to the real world and uh, segments that, you know, people that have this flag turned on can um, uh, use it and give feedback. Um, so there is actually a manifesto and the slides are, are linked on, my, on the Drupal session page. So just go there and, and um, it's just called the extensiblewebmanifesto.org. Um, so Houdini, what it does is it modifies the browser engine. Um, and we're gonna go through the process of the browser engine really quick here. Uh, this is why I marked the session advanced even though it's kind of an overview because if, if this diagram, if this is the first time you're seeing this diagram, a lot of this won't click immediately. Um, but, but this is the, the way that a web browser goes from taking text files on a server and turning them into pixels on your screen. Um, there, there is, this is even kind of like a high level overview, but a front end dev, the average front end dev like myself or many people in the crowd, this is how we understand it. Um, and so the first box here is parser. That is when the text comes to your browser and the browser reads through it, tokenizes everything and builds two object models. One is the document object model, the DOM, and the other is the CSS object model, the CSS OM. It doesn't really roll off the tongue, but that's what it is. Uh, so these two object models are big trees. You can think of them as a big hierarchical tree. And what happens is they're com c combined together inside the browser and you get the cascade. And so then what happens is these elements either match up with each other or they don't and then the browser knows how to style the elements in the DOM. So once everything, once the DOM has been styled, it moves on to a layout phase and it positions various boxes all over the place from top to bottom. Your web page gets these boxes and it might be a layout level box. So we're just doing header, main body element, footer. But inside those we have various components you know, little card with a bio picture and a title and, and you know, a Twitter link. Um, each of those have to be laid out in turn. So the layout step, you know, provides the general structure of the page. Then the non-layout CSS properties are painted. So this would be background color or gradients, um, box shadows, text colors, and, and all these kinds of things that are visual, um, except for a set that will come in the next step, which is the composite phase, and this is the GPU layer, and there are just a few properties that are done after the paint has happened, um, and those are, this isn't an exhaustive list, but opacity, CSS transforms, and, oh man, I had another one in my head. Filters, CSS filters. Those are um, examples of GPU accelerated CSS properties which are applied during the compositing phase um, and those can be sped up. So um, the DOM and the CSS OM in this diagram have uh, colors because the DOM is fully accessible by JavaScript, not news, and the CSS OM has partial JavaScript access, but it's not all the way. So when we want to polyfill CSS or we want to change the way that CSS works in any way, the go-to solution right now is to edit the DOM and do some custom data handling or logic in the background. For instance, most element queries or container query solutions use DOM attributes like data attributes and based on how, you know, it measures how big the, the component is and then applies a label to it like data EQ equals small or data EQ equals medium, yada, yada. The problem with that is when we polyfill something and are altering the DOM, every step to the right of the DOM in this diagram, that is all of them, have to be recalculated. So when we alter the DOM or even in some cases read from it in order to do this element query thing, even reading the DOM triggers an entire render of the of the page again. Uh, well, actually, that's not 
entirely true sometimes, but it can cause most of these things to happen, the cascade, the layout, the paint, the composite. Um, and so doing that once is okay. If it takes 30 milliseconds, you've traded a tiny fraction of time for something powerful. But when you're doing this uh, in response to a scroll event or something that happens frequently, um, then that's when you get degraded uh, rendering performance and things look choppy, things don't uh, move smoothly and, and you know these kinds of problems. So Houdini is basically solving this problem of having to edit something way in the beginning of this process in order to achieve something that might only be relevant in the end. Um, and so all of these uh, boxes in this new diagram with Houdini are blue because we'll have scripting access to all of them. That's the good news. Um, so there will be a spec for each one of these steps now. Um, they're grouped into two main categories. At the bottom there, there's um, the CSS Properties and Values API, which has to do with actually writing CSS or reading it or recognizing it, and then worklets, um, which are basically little JavaScript files, and I'll kind of clarify all these one by one, but there's two main categories which are either extending CSS or doing custom actions. And out of these two uh, major groups, we get each one of these uh, Houdini specs. So first is the parser API. What this allows us to do is when the browser is receiving raw text from a server, it actually allows us to do the things that preprocessors have been doing for years already. Um, we can add new syntax to CX CSS. You could create a whole new block type, block being anything that's between two curly braces. You could add new pseudo classes. You could add nesting if you really wanted to. I don't think that's something that I want to try, but uh, someone will definitely do it. Um, so an example would be adding an extensed property to CSS. and the browser itself handles this. It's not in SAS beforehand. It's not pre-compiled to something that we're doing, you know, that can be read today. It's just an extends which functions natively in the browser. Or you might want to write your own media query, um, you know, like an offline media query. I was surprised it didn't exist. Uh, but I wanted it once I thought of the example. Um, this particular spec is now under the web initiative community group. I think that's what it's called. It was the responsive images community group before, but they've kind of transitioned to a greater role. Um, and so they took this one over. It's not in the actual Houdini task force. The next is the CSS typed object model. So we've got a CSS OM, the, the object model. That's level one, what we have today. This is basically CSS object model level two, and it adds typing, typed variables. Now you might think, oh, it's not that big of a deal. I can concatenate a five and a px, and now I've got, you know, my value. But when we use type variables, uh, what happens is that more things can be transitioned between each other, and we get much more intelligent. Um, it, you can animate things that could not be animated before. The example that I really hope this solves, I, I'm not positive that it will do it, but this is the type of thing we should see if this is successful, that when you have an object that is by default, you know, you've got a title and it's 24 pixels tall, and when you click it, you want it to do some like expando collapso to an unknown height because it's just like an accordion with variable height uh, pieces in the accordion. Normally, what I do is I say, okay, you know, I got like uh, uh, min height auto and min, or max, sorry, max height auto max height 24, and you're toggling between this max height variable because, uh, or I'm sorry, I just said what you're gonna be able to do, sorry. You're gonna be able to transition between auto and a number, because right now what you have to do is you transition between 24 and 1,000, and you just make sure that 1,000 is bigger than the biggest block of content that you have. And it makes your transitions funky, because if you pick a time, it's transitioning between 24 and 202 pixels, but your transition is timed between 24 and 1,000, so you get a really fast transition on the open, 
and then a delay followed by a awkward half transition at the end of the thing. And this typed object model is in theory going to be able to solve these types of problems where even auto is a machine readable number that can be transitioned to. Or maybe two colors can be transitioned uh, between two formats, uh, something like that. So typing variables will allow a lot of flexibility that wasn't present before, but it's really kind of an under the hood thing that someone might never even be exposed to. And that's the cool part about this. Someone will just be able to use auto and 24 and they'll never know that we ever had this uh, problem. The props and values API is an actual spec and what it does is it supercharges custom properties. So the last talk was about custom properties. If you were here for that one, you just got familiar with them and this should uh, be showing something that's a little bit familiar. The deal is that you can register a property, but you can also register its type, just like the typed object model. You can register a, an initial value and its inheritance behavior. So none of these things can happen with custom properties right now. They're all strings internally in the browser. So you can't transition between uh, values often. Um, it's just, a, it just, it just switches. Um, so this will help you define properties and define their behavior, which again lets you animate them, transition them, and do CSS things um, that you can't do yet. So worklets, uh, like I said, are, are kind of mini web workers, and I really can't dive into this because I've just got a few more minutes, but web workers are off-thread JavaScript that was originally designed for uh, computationally heavy uh, things. And the heavy computation is pushed off thread so that it doesn't block the UI and you can continue using the web app while it crunches a diagram or something and then it spits back the, the finished DOM. Um, so worklets are also off thread, which means by definition they don't have DOM access. Um, web workers do have event listeners, but worklets won't because the event is this step in the rendering process. Either the layout or the paint or the composite step in the rendering is the event that the worklet is responding to. Web workers are never, they're not designed to run in parallel or execute quickly. They are doing really heavy tasks, but worklets are designed to be very small, very tiny, and execute very fast because they, in theory, are going to be run up to 120 times per second. Um, you know, 60 is our, is our goal now, but you know, even if like with an iPad Pro, that thing runs at 120 hertz, so eventually the, the, the threshold is gonna get moved up. And so um, there are pieces of the JavaScript APIs that actually aren't um, available in worklets because they want to restrict slow operations. And um, ideally, you would even use code that can be compiled down to like WASM or, or WebAssembly so that it can run at near C speeds. That's the idea in the end. So, worklets. Sorry to throw all this at you. I've got 25, I've got three minutes. Um, so, an example of a layout worklet would be something like masonry. The masonry is a classic thing where it delivers something really cool to you, but it's thrashing your DOM in order to, in order to deliver that thing. And so as a worklet, masonry, all the logic that masonry does can be moved off to this, you know, in theory, near C speed uh, script, and then the developer can just write display masonry instead of display block or display inline. You've just got this whole new layout available to you and you have custom defined layouts. You could do display cube, you know, you know anything, anything you can think of, um, which I think is a really cool idea. And so instead of you know, clogging up this DOM phase with, with this layout type scripting, you're doing it in the layout phase of the browser and everything is a little bit more um, compartmentalized and uh, cleanly executed. The Paint API is another one. It essentially provides the functionality of the canvas tag as an image, as a CSS image. So, um, you know, dot face, anything with a face class will get this face painted. Uh, and you can um, enhance these, uh, you can enhance the 
worklet with CSS custom properties that act as arguments to a JavaScript file. So every custom property that has to do with face, and I, you know, you don't have to name it this way, but I did because it seems like an easy way to understand, but now I've said face mood is, is happy by default, and then if you've got some sort of, uh, you know, like a BEM modifier where you want to make the face sad, then the face mood is sad and it will automatically draw the, the sad face and it can be transitioned and do all this nice, uh, cool stuff that JavaScript can do. You know, the, the, it doesn't just have to change, it can, it can you know, tears can, can slowly pour out of my face. I should have done sad and then happy because I have Houdini. Okay, I kind of messed that up. So the tears are going away now. Um, and then this is actually the coolest one and I think it's the most anticipated by both the, the browser vendors and personally myself for sure, composited scrolling and animation. And what this will do is, uh, this is finally at that last step in the process, this is the composite step where we do all those fast GPU uh, uh, executable um, properties and we will be able to key uh, very um, GPU friendly properties to other things besides time. So everyone knows pull to refresh, right? And no one can make that shit work well on the web. You know, like you can't get a really smooth, fluid, cool uh, uh, shape that morphs as you wiggle it up and down with your finger and you try to figure out how that particular one looks good. But animation worklets are designed specifically to let that sort of thing happen. So instead of using a timing function and then actually, there will still be a timing function with animations, but the timing will not come from time itself, it will come from user input. So you will be able to advance through an animation using uh, user input, scrolling, gestures, and that kind of thing. And that makes me super excited because it will seriously just bring web Websites will look like native apps and period, it will be equal because they'll be running at a, the, the speed difference will be meaningless um, after a couple rounds of, of optimization and stuff like that as, as, we, as this stuff matures. So interactions on par with native apps is the thing that I think will really make, blow this up huge. And um, they're actually, Chrome is already starting to build new specs on top of this Houdini, these Houdini features, the pieces that they have. And although they don't expose them to us, they're already there inside Chrome, and they're building new features with this part of the pipeline already. So they rebuilt CSS snap points. Um, Position Sticky is being re-engineered completely from being like native C code to being a Houdini animation worklet. And then as I said, the like animations which are based on user input, which will make everything feel so much more natural. Um, so, uh, this is the set of specs, and I know that like there's, it's kind of light on details, but uh, this is, uh, you know, as a whole family of specs, this is going to really change the way that, um, you know, what CSS can do without really making it harder for the CSS author in general. So if you get really excited, go check the website again, but, uh, you know, it's not really there yet. Um, and now that I've given my talk, I don't want to be saying you should listen to me just because uh, I'm me. So my name's Chris and I live in Germany, uh, but uh, I'm happy to talk about this stuff later. I'm a little short on time. Um, I don't know if we have any time for questions really. Is, uh, nope. All right, so, and unfortunately, I want to run to another session that's starting in a second, but uh, Catch me in the hall somewhere the rest of the day. There is a sprint happening tomorrow. Go look for the sprint lounge on the map and go check the website for the details. And uh, uh, if you read these slides later, please let me know how you feel and send some feedback on the DrupalCon website. Thank you very much.
Yeah, exactly. That is explicitly what it is.